Um, okay, the, uh, first of all, the title of my talk is going to be Washington Women, Joan Allen in the White House, but I'm going to go through several stages to get up to that uh, particular focus. Um, Robin, thanks for the introduction. Um, this has been an interesting historical moment, and uh, I want to thank uh, Joe and Robin for the invitation and everyone who's working on the film festival for their help, especially Dennis Malik, um, for the technical support. Uh, this is a really impressive event, and it's in a fabulous venue, so I hope that I can do justice to that with my contribution. When I was first asked to about making a presentation, I was uh, glad to suggest something on representing national politics in the cinema uh, since the talk would follow right on the national election campaign. And I couldn't know at that point what would transpire uh, and just how remarkable this election season would actually be. With uh, Hillary Clinton as a leading uh, candidate uh, in the primaries, and then the surprise addition of Sarah Palin to the Republican ticket, we've had an interesting chance to see how gender plays out in the national election arena. And the films I'm going to talk about relate to gender issues in an illuminating way. Also, since the election has been so close, it was uh, challenging to write up this talk while realizing I wouldn't know the outcome uh, until uh, election night, and, or if history might have repeated itself, perhaps not for weeks afterwards, uh, as the ballots in key states were contested. What I want to do is move through three different uh, phases of this talk, moving from a very broad and general to a much more specific uh, direction. First, I want to briefly discuss the way Hollywood has presented Washington and national pol politicians. Then I want to reflect on how we can represent the political and the personal in cinematic, dramatic form. Finally, I want to discuss two films, Nixon, Oliver Stone, uh, 1995, and The Contender, Rob Lurie, 2000, as examples of a commercial entertainment cinema that takes on political issues in terms of matters of state and the behavior of politicians. I want to discuss Joan Allen's performance of two characters, uh, Pat Nixon and fictional Senator uh, Lane Hansen, in terms of their position as the moral center of those dramas. So I was really um, felt great about seeing uh, Murray Pomerantz's talk about Joan Allen as a character actor this morning, because I think it was extremely illuminating to give us a sense of her uh, career and also uh, the particular unique things about her um, acting. Um, and uh, so I think it, that blends in very well into uh, what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. Okay, the uh, first part. In the first country to elect a movie star as president, Hollywood's rep representations of politicians range from reverence to ridicule just like American public opinion has about its political leaders. I'd like to remind you about that range because I think it's useful for imagining the terrain that could be present in such a drama. And just by the way, you might want to take notes because uh, I'm going to list a bunch of titles that you would later like to rent on video um, or check out at the library. One model that we could use would be what I call the heroic archetype. And we can think here of a classic piece of American cinema, Henry Fonda in Young Mr. Lincoln by director John Ford in 1939. In a very amusing and instructive early sequence, the young lawyer rides into Springfield on a donkey, and then, as the most eligible young bachelor present, is asked to judge the pies at a fair. The comic moment has Lincoln tasting first the apple pie and then the peach pie, and then saying he can't decide. And I better have another slice of that apple, and eating a little bit of it. And this is mighty good, 
but I'd better have a little more of this peach. And it's a, it's a wonderful, silly, warm-hearted uh, kind of sequence that depicts Lincoln significantly, both as a hungry young man, which is narratively where he is right at the beginning, and also a very clever, great reconciler who is able in this small moment to reveal his talent for, res for resolving conflict, which of course is then his historical identity. Another model that we could use would be what I would call sentimental populism of Frank Capra's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, 19, also 1939. Remember that the, the dramatic scene at the end with Jimmy uh, Stewart's final heroic emotional speech in the Congress and the fine villain Claude Rains uh, present. Here, heartfelt passion for simple justice confronts the corruption of politics as usual in Washington with the final triumph of good by the end of the film. Both of these films are examples of films that are both commercially and popularly successful in their time and which contribute to the popular imagination of American national politics. They interweave a dramatic personal story with a historic or public moment in national life. And they make us think that individuals can change history by their character, their actions, and their noble sentiments. There's a large group of films about national level politics that I would call liberal films. Liberal in the sense that they basically affirm the value system and practice of US government institutions as able to deal with the challenges and confrontations uh, that come forward. And to be healthy enough to, after difficulty, change and evolve, rather than what we might call a conservative trend to simply appeal to tradition and return to a previous imagined order. Conservative films, in this sense, tend to deal more with military events than governmental ones, and the heroism of leaders that aims to uh, restore a previous level of order. Okay, so it's there, there's disorder, the hero comes in and will return us to that original state. Whereas I think the liberal films uh, posit much more of an evolution that this is very difficult, but we'll somehow transcend and evolve into a newer situation that accounts for the conflict that has erupted. These, these liberal films often show the inner workings of the state at crisis moments, which allow leaders to come forward to the challenges. And I'm thinking here of films such as uh, Advise and Consent, by, uh, directed by Otto Preminger in 1962, based on a famous successful novel. The Best Man, directed by Franklin Sh uh, J. Schaefer, written by Gore Vidal in 1964 or a whole slew of liberal thriller films, such as Seven Days in May, directed by John Frankenheimer in 1964, uh, in which uh, there's an impending military coup of the US government, uh, which is headed off at uh, the, the last minute. In this thriller genre, we could probably also add, although it uh, is about historical rather than fictional circumstances, All the President's Men, about reporters uncovering the Watergate cover-up. An interesting twist on the liberal formula is the, what I call the liberal paranoia film, such as The Manchurian Candidate, or The Parallax View, or Oliver Stone's JFK film. These films are usually quite pessimistic about the possibility of meaningful change. Uh, and there's some sort of a conspiracy or problem, and we're not really sure if uh, things will um, be resolved or we'll just uh, end up in this terrible uh, paranoid universe uh, on into the future. A very important and appealing subgenre is the liberal satire film, which exposes the flaws and distortions of the system and American society with an eye to calling for reform in order to strengthen the system in the long run. <clears throat> 